All right, welcome back from lunch break. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, wireless signals and fuzzing. Uh, and the stage is belongs to Matt and Ryan now. Matt and Ryan, have fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Matt Knight. This is Ryan Spears. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, a piece of software that we developed to unify an approach to, to provide a unified approach to RF fuzzing. Uh, we're calling it uh, TumbleRF. Uh, so my name is Matt Knight. Um, as of recently, I'm an independent uh, software hardware and RF engineer. Um, it's, uh, he'll have more to say about that, I'm sure. Um, but I also, in my free time, do some work with uh, Riverloop Security, which is a consultancy that he and I are both involved with. Um, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Dartmouth, um, and my interests um, are really encompass all things RF, software-defined radio, uh, as well as physical layers and embedded systems, too. So that's me. Great. And as Matt said, I'm Ryan Spears. Very happy to be with you guys today. Thanks for having us. Uh, I was one of the co-founders at Riverloop Security and also lead research at Ionic Security. We get to do a lot of cryptography, embedded reverse engineering. Um, I love 802.15.4, and you'll probably well, love attacking 802.15.4, and you'll probably see a little bit of that today. Um, so, I don't know if you actually wanted me to make a joke about you quitting <laughs> just for this talk, your job, and just I'm, so you can I'm be I'm enjoying 10 days of unemployment. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. So I came to Troopers to celebrate. Uh, <laughs> So great, there's a few background topics that we want to give credit to other people we've worked with in the past on these materials. Um, at Troopers 14, uh, Javier and I gave a talk on uh, making a wireless intrusion detection system and then immediately breaking it. You'll see some of those techniques uh, today. And also we published with some of these other uh, neighbors here, um, Travis and, and uh, is able to be here today somewhere. He's probably sleeping after last night. He's here in spirit. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, in, in spirit. And so we published a paper going into more of the science and depth behind uh, some of these materials uh, with the ACM. But today we're going to be focusing on mechanisms for doing our fuzzing, how do we do bug discovery on these, and how can we generate fingerprints of the actual physical silicon that's being used in the phi layer, uh, their, specifically their finite state machine, or FSM. So. That's the agenda we're going to go through. We're going to show you some of the background. We're going to actually tell you why existing tools were lacking. We didn't just do this for fun. Trust me. Um, and then we'll go through sort of how we thought about architecting a, a system designed to do this type of fuzzing on different hardware platforms. And uh, then we're going to do a live demo. And we did not have time to record it, so it's better work live. Uh, and that's more fun anyways. So first of all, some background on uh, traditional fuzzing techniques, right? So what is fuzzing? Don't worry, I'm not going to bore you guys with this, right? Mo most people know, but as a background, it's auto how do we automate discovery of crashes? How do we find corner cases? So we're basically feeding in unexpected input or permutations of legitimate input and looking for the state to be something that changes from normal. Um, so typical fuzzing, right? I'm sure many people in the room have done this input-output fuzzing on programs, file format parsers, right? A lot of great work there. Fuzzing different network interfaces, and there's great tools for these, right? Um, there's, you know, for maybe doing it on a program using AFL or AFL Unicorn, which I'll talk more about in a bit. Uh, Peach, Scappy, and plenty of tools that either you have used or maybe even your companies make. Um, and so for Software fuzzing, it is a well-developed thing for network services. These work well. For file formats, these work great. Um, because software is something that we can instrument and hook at different levels, right? And especially when you see stuff like AFL that hooks very deeply into the memory of a program, uh, you see why that instrumentation really helps do great fuzzing. But what else can we fuzz, right? And fuzzing hardware is what we like to focus on, right? We attack, as I said, mostly at Riverloop embedded systems. And so the, a lot of those tools are, are difficult uh, for us to use for the purposes that we need. So hardware, you know, why, right? Hardware is often, in many cases, a one-off for that specific piece of hardware. It has different input-output. It's configured differently. Somebody has written bare metal firmware. We can't write a harness that just sits on a generic OS or three OSs, four, six, whatever we want to claim there are, and uh, you know, have a test harness around things. So. There are some existing things in this space, right? AFL Unicorn 
allows us, if we can properly simulate and, and put the unicorn emulation engine around an uh, embedded piece of firmware, then we can do uh, you know, hook in AFL to that and, and do fuzzing. Uh, when we do this, we, we see it does take a lot of time to set up that emulation environment. Um, uh, Bus Pirate, JTagulator, plenty of other tools that are made in, in the open source community will help us permute different pinouts to find things like JTAG and serial buses. But what we're talking about today is a little different from that. We're talking about how do we fuzz in on these RF interfaces. So there are a few that exist. Uh, YFuzz was very focused on 802.11, uh, very protocol specific. Mark, thanks for coming, Mark. You didn't know this was going to be up here. Um, is injecting, he built some tools, which I hope he releases the code in this framework later, um, <laughs> to inject RF uh, packets for the NRF uh, 2.4 gigahertz dongle, trying to find issues in uh, USB things and great research that you guys should look at if you haven't looked at mouse check. And then uh, I had done some work with some other people a while ago uh, doing some fuzzing under the name of Isotope. Again, I was just as terrible as Mark was. We did not build nice, flexible libraries. We banged out some code to get the project over, right? And that's really what we're trying to address. How can we make a framework that's easy to extend um, so that Mark and I can contribute to it, especially Mark? Um, so. The existing fuzzers, as I just mentioned about Mark's terrible existing fuzzer, is <laughs> siloed and protocol specific. Uh, it's generally, <laughs> thanks for sitting in the front, by the way. Uh, it's generally <laughs> limited to the Mac layer or above. Um, and then you have to figure out what is a crash? What's a bug, right? And, and RF is tough to instrument. We can't just hook into the memory and watch for a bit to flip. So how do we measure these different things where we have different levels of access? Sometimes we never even have serial on the system that we're fuzzing, right? So we can't go in a console and look for things, right? Other times we can. Um, and then maybe most uh, notably, there's also we hit this issue with implicit trust in the chipset that we're using. If we're asking a piece of hardware to give us radio symbols, there's things about it, as we'll show today, that matter, right? And, and it says that it's protocol specific. It should be the same. It should be standards, but they're not exactly. And we'll, we'll show you how we find some of those differences. Um, so that was basically, in summary, not all physical layer state machines, especially on these RF chips, are created the same. They implement the state machines differently. Uh, we can fingerprint and exploit those differences. And we found, uh, you know, in the trooper, last Trooper's talk I gave, I'm gonna, I promise I'm going to break this theme next time. Um, was some results on 802.15.4 where we can specifically craft physical layer frames that are seen by some radios and not by others. And this is not directional antennas. This is not different power. This is not different protocols. This is same power, same direction, same RF noises getting to both of these chips. But one is made by Atmel, one is made by TI or, or whoever. Um, and they implement the state machine slightly differently. And we can craft special frames that one can see but is totally blind to the other. And that's what we're going to go through getting to today. So Matt's going to take over. All right, so I'm going to do a, just a brief high-level walkthrough of, of how uh, radio physical layers work so that we can better understand exactly how we, how we can uh, uh, craft these characterizations. So uh, a transmitter is essentially a, a radio that goes from digital data bits into analog RF energy. Um, so you're going from a discreetly sampled uh, quantity of information to continuous, um, uh, continuous analog properties. The receiver does the opposite. Uh, it's taking uh, this continuous, uh, continuous analog signal uh, and is uh, sampling it. So it's converting that from, from uh, analog RF energy into bits. Um, so receiving comes down to sampling and synchronization of those, those uh, radio signals. Um, I'm just going to do a little, uh, uh, little um, kind of thought exercise here. Um, here's a picture of a waveform. Uh, we have um, time in the x-axis and frequency in the y-axis, and then powers in the, uh, the z-axis from how bright it is. And uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you see uh, there's a pattern there. Uh, the signal alternates between two frequencies um, for a period of time uh, before becoming uh, uh, less, um, less consistent in, in, its, uh, in its structure there. So that uh, uh, first uh, element, uh, indicated by the red arrow is the preamble. Uh, and the preamble is uh, essentially a header that's prefixed onto, onto the packet to tell a receiving radio, A, that there's a packet heading its way, and B, some information about uh, uh, the clock characteristics so that it can synchronize against it. 
as soon as you see that discontinuity pointed at by the yellow arrow, uh, that is called a start of frame delimiter or a sync word. And that is essentially a magic number or magic value that the receiver is looking for. And when it sees that, it, it knows from that from seeing that value that the uh, it knows from seeing that value that the preamble's over, and what follows it is data that should be synchronized and sampled sampled from. And that's the blue arrow, the arrow there. It's actually is, is what you can see modulated there. So this is a uh, a very simplistic view of an of a RF physical layer state machine. Uh, we start uh, and kind of default into that idle case up top, uh, where the radio is just sitting and looking for the preamble. Um, once it sees that alternating pattern, it moves into the next state where it looks for the start of frame delimiter. And once it hits that, that other magic value, it runs through the rest of the states, where it goes and tries to extract a length from the header, if there is one, to figure out how many bits to sample out. Uh, it demodulates that many bits. Most of the time, we'll check a CRC, and then we'll present that frame back up to uh, the la layer two parser, whether that's another uh, element within that chipset or if it's passing it over some sort of a serial bus back to a host. Um, that's basically where the, the interface ends. And then it returns to that preamble state. So we're going to begin just by digging into these first two states and talking about uh, how they're instrumented. So the way to think about, about these two states is essentially within your radio, uh, there's a shift register where when bits are received, they get demodulated and they get pushed into that register. Uh, in parallel with this, we have uh, essentially a, a correlation operation where those bits are getting XORed against, uh, against the pattern that's being looked for. So if we're looking for the preamble, we're looking for that alternating pattern of 1 and 0, 1 and 0. And if we're looking for a sync, uh, an SFD, we're looking instead for the SFD to appear in that shift register. Um, so these bits are getting shifted through, um, and, and that operation is, is, ha is happening uh, with every symbol that comes in. Um, so it turns out that uh, not all of these sync words and preamble uh, detection algorithms are, are created equally. Uh, you know, RF standards are really complicated. The IEEE 802.15.4 spec, uh, which is a protocol we're going to be talking about um, more in this presentation, is like thousands of pages long. It's very dense. There are multiple different um, actual PHY implementations that can be chosen from. But even within a single PHY variant, uh, very complicated. There are lots of things to, to, to get right and wrong. But there are also some things that are not necessarily deterministically uh, defined in the, phys in the standard. So when uh, a standards body creates this document, uh, they, they come to some consensus of what they want the physical error to look like. And then it gets handed over to the manufacturers, who then have to, have to take that document and interpret it uh, into their own design of what that physical error implementation is going to look like. And uh, if you go to the next slide, um, essentially, uh, some of these, some of these uh, preambles and sync words uh, get implemented with different degrees of, uh, of sensitivity. And the research that, uh, that Ryan presented the last time he was here uh, showed that some of these uh, chipsets correlate on, on different values uh, for preamble and sync. And uh, if we strategically malform them by, say, sh uh, sending a short preamble or uh, alternating the sync word, uh, we can reveal some interesting characteristics. Uh, so uh, fuzzing is how we're going to uh, take this approach from 15.4 and apply it to, um, to other protocols in a generic way. So when we were talking about earlier, what, help, what can we do that helps make uh, a framework that can be used um, and reused for other purposes, not just for what we're showing you today, but extended, we thought through what is the ideal state machine design here? Right, so we first of all want it to be extensible. We want it to be easy to add new radios to this framework. We want to be plug-in based, right? We want to be able to change in different test cases, different interfaces, different uh, harnesses, which you'll see later. Um, and we want to be able to reuse concepts and designs, right? So the, the stuff we're going to be showing on 802.15.4 today, modulating a, a preamble, we want to be able to take that and with the right interface, do that on many different types of radios to see where in other protocols, whether that be Bluetooth or LoRa, Matt's favorite, or, or whatever, you know, anything that Mark finds in Mousejack, or anything that you want to explore, and take these same concepts with minimal effort and port them over to that. Um, and we want to expose uh, the file layer instead of just the Mac or just the application layer, because we think that that reveals some interesting properties. So how do we go about actually delivering this? Uh, what we're going to be sharing today, and we'll post the code. I didn't get a chance to push it to GitHub before this talk, but I promise I will do it before I leave this room, or at least before the second beer after this talk. We will push this to GitHub 
um, is a framework called TumbleRF, where we implemented this. Uh, you may have seen, you may say, well, in the talk it was called Onf API, and I really wanted to know that was what that was for. We just didn't have a name yet, so <laughs> ignore that. So what it is is a software framework for, to enable fuzzing of arbitrary RF protocols. Uh, we try to abstract the key concepts for it. So if you take a look from it in an architecture point of view, uh, we have a few components. Right? The, the, in the top left, we have a generator for different test cases. So this is what basically can be hooked in with uh, other frameworks, uh, you know, Sully fuzzing, anything, Peach, anything else that you want to use and take in test cases or that you can write, write in this framework. That goes into a test case management uh, suite, which we drive via a pretty flexible command line interface, um, and then sends out data over different PHY interfaces or uh, different uh, transmit interfaces. That magical RF energy that Matt thinks looks a lot like a lightning bolt in this slide goes over to the harness on the right-hand side. And the harness, I mean, that's really how it looks, guys. Um, and, and the harness is what measures the state of the receiver, right? So this can be as simple as, did I get an acknowledgment frame back? Or this could be if you have more access to the uh, device under test, you could be sitting watching the serial output or watching over SSH to see if a process crashes or, or something happens. Um, and then, of course, it's not helpful if you don't log out the results. So we even threw that in for free. So based on this architecture, um, we're going to now walk through the different components of that to show you what can be extended into and how you can build on top of it. Sure. So we're, we're talking about going after uh, RF interfaces and hardware as well. Uh, so in order to be able to instrument, in, to, in order to be able to interact with uh, those protocols, we have to have access to interfaces, uh, whether that's a software-defined radio or, um, or hardware radios, whatever we're using to both transmit. Uh, signals as a stimulus uh, at the device under test, and then how we monitor the device under test itself. So basically what we've done uh, uh, in order to, to represent that is we've created this component called the interface. Uh, and the interface is essentially an API that abstracts all of the, uh, the common uh, and really necessary RF functions uh, to be as generic as possible. So uh, say you have a new radio chipset or a new protocol that you want to be able to go after and fuzz. Uh, that is likely going to have a driver of its own, um, whether, it's, uh, um, whether it's something like, uh, like Killer B for 802.15.4 or any of like the host-based host Ubertooth drivers, um, what have you. Uh, what you. What you would have to do in order to hook it up with, um, uh, with TumbleRF is inherit our base interface class and then redefine these functions that you see here to map from our abstracted API into your uh, protocol-specific API. So some of these are pretty straightforward. Um, uh, setting and getting the channel uh, is just tuning the radio, you know, what frequencies it's looking at. Um, we're going to add, you know, for, you can also optionally extend the class to add others in case there are other modulation parameters too. So maybe change, changing the modulation order, changing the symbol rate, the bit rate, things like that. Um, that's not part of the core functionality, but um, this is where you could extend it to, to implement that. Um, setting and getting the SFD and preamble are pretty straightforward as well. Um, and you can hook that up to your generator to be able to, um, to, to change all those automatically. Um, transmit, uh, you pass it a buffer, it sends out the packet, and then RX stop, start, and pull are all around receiving. So RX start uh, turns on the radio receiver and puts it into a listening mode. RX stop tells it to stop, um, but then RX pull is what you call while you're in that receive mode uh, to get packets back um, uh, if, if there were any detected. Uh, so, uh, it really is that simple. It really just does come down to, to these functions, um, and it's pretty easy to, uh, to interface and extend. So then the next component is a generator, right? So as I said earlier, this is where the test cases are created. Um, you can extend this, and the two things that you have to provide um, at minimum is something that can spit out control cases, which sort of is your normal, unpermuted, normal packet, right? And then the test case, and these are uh, implemented as Python iterators, so you can produce a lot of different test cases out of these. Um, we have put in for today, uh, for the initial release, three different generators. We ported and cleaned up from my old, ugly isotope code, uh, the preamble length generator, and something called Franconian notch, which uh, is, uh, puts non-standard symbols in the preamble, like Fs instead of zeros. Um, and then we also have one that spits in random payloads into the messages. 
So uh, to extend and, and be able to try out new fuzz cases, you actually, if you're on a protocol that's already supported from an interface perspective, you just have to add one of these. And then the harnesses are in charge of, as I said earlier, hearing back and, and seeing what the state of the device under test is. So we have uh, put in three. We're going to be using in the demo today um, the received frame check harness. This is one that is very simple. It actually takes another interface, puts it into receive mode, and says, hey, did I get that packet? And for five-layer fingerprinting, this actually is very effective, very reliable, um, and, and works, works fine for it. Um, for systems that you don't have control over or you can't directly interface with the radio, you need to use one of the other two uh, or extend an additional one. So we have, uh, there's, there's code in there to watch serial lines coming in to basically look for a log output like corrupt frame received or something like that. This one actually, I believe, also can uh, implement re power cycling the target uh, by pulling a reset pin on it. Uh, so if it gets into a crash state, you can bring it back automatically. Um, and then uh, we also have an SSH process check one, which obviously, with our favorite reboot command, can reset it. But uh, moreover, is looking to see if a process crashes. And then the last component, I promise we will stop going over software architecture right after lunch and move on to a demo. Uh, but the last one is, how do we coordinate? How do we tie all of these together? So you either implement a run test, which is basically nested for loops, very classy. Or uh, you can extend, the one we're going to be using today is an extension of the alternator case, which basically has two things. It tries out doing the control case, make sure that passes, and once it does pass, then it'll throw a test case, reset if needed, and, and continue on going through those. Yeah. And the control case is important because we're looking for, for behavior that induces non-standard behavior within our physical layer. So if, say, we send a packet that gets the radio into some state that it can't recover from, we want to know that the radio is in that unrecoverable state before we continue with our testing, because that may induce false positives. So that alternator is a way of ensuring that the radio is in a known good state, ensuring that it's still receiving packets, is still able to respond uh, before continuing with subsequent tests. So uh, same diagram as before, just two additional boxes to show you the exact architecture setup that we're going to be using in the demo. Um, the only change here is that the harness, we're using that received frame check harness. So if we look inside of it, it's actually going to have a receive interface. For the demo, it looks like Matt's plugged in an RZ USB stick, which is an Atmel 802.15.4 uh, stick. Then there's obviously the comparison logic inside the alt um, to see if the, the right frame came in. Did the one we send come into the receive side? Right? We don't want to pick up something that you guys, especially the people in the front row, are injecting into the thing in the middle of the talk. Um, and the, the transmit interface is, uh, for this demo, going to be a USRP B210, uh, which is a software-defined radio. So what are we going to be uh, generating as the data? Sure. So we're going to be um, fuzzing uh, this 802.15.4 radio with different cases of non-standard uh, preambles. So Ryan mentioned we've got this Atmel RZ USB stick. Um, it's essentially a dev board uh, that has a, um, a, a standard Atmel 802.15.4 radio bolted to, I think it's like an AVR32 or something like that, AVR32 um, USB back to a host. And we have uh, software support to interface with that via Killerbee, uh, which is an 802.15.4 framework that, uh, that Ryan and uh, the team at Riverloop maintains. Uh, so when, uh, when this thing receives a packet, we'll be able to, or we'll be able to, to control it, set the channel, um, you know, put it into different states through Killer B, and uh, receive packets just nicely over USB whenever they come in. Uh, as, a, as a stimulus to this, uh, I'm going to be injecting packets um, via this, this USRP. Uh, I have a, um, I'll talk more about the, um, the uh, signal generation in a moment. But the case that we're going to be running through is sending different uh, variants of non standard 802.15.4 preambles. So uh, this is what the standard 15, or the standards compliant 15.4 preamble uh, looks like. We have four octets of, um, of zero valued, uh, zero valued uh, code words here. So four of those, followed by a sync word or SFD that's valued at A7. Uh, and then there's a length value, which we're not going to touch. But then what follows that is the MAC frame. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to begin by sending a compliant 15.4 uh, frame, and then we're slowly going to take away some of, those, uh, some of those octets until finally we're just left with the SFD. 
and we're going to see if, if this chipset is willing and able to, uh, to play along with a non-standard compliant preamble. And again, if we think back to the state machine, think about the logic of how this is going to work. Uh, the radio is, 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 you know, it's running through a deterministic algorithm that's baked into a, its silicon. It's looking for, uh, for some correlation score uh, against the preamble and against the SFD. So if it's correlating for, for just the 8-bit SFD and doesn't care about the preamble, then we would expect, expect to detect packets with this. But maybe it's looking for, um, for the SFD and 16 bits of preamble. Uh, these are all decisions that the, that the chipset designers have to make when they're, when they're designing this, this IC. So by doing this test, we're going to be able to fingerprint uh, whether, or not, um, whether or not this chipset is, is able to accept um, kind of a, a poorly formed or, um, or corrupted uh, pre, uh, preambles. So to generate the preamble data, uh, I'm going to be using a software-defined radio framework to, um, uh, to produce non-standard 802.15.4 uh, non 802 frames. You don't have to use a software-defined radio to do this. Um, you can use um, a device like the AppyMote, uh, which is a uh, 802.15.4 injector uh, that you can, uh, through some, some tricks, some embedded tricks, you can, uh, you can configure it to um, send uh, non-standard uh, physical airframes as well. Um, but uh, SDR is pretty easy to, to, to do this, and there were some uh, well-instrumented tools to get up and running with this. So uh, there's a wonderful um, GNU Radio out of tree module called GR IEEE 802.15.4. Uh, it's maintained by Bastian Blosel. Uh, does a really nice job with it. Um, and uh, getting it to so that we can send arbitrary, an arbitrary phi header was as easy as bypassing that um, access code prefixer block, um, which uh, and that's what puts in the, the preamble octets, the SFD length, and all that. So by, by disabling that and, and rebuilding it, um, we're able to uh, present it with five values of our own, and it's happy to, to modulate and send them. So that's the setup. Let's, uh, let's do it live. So I'm going to jump over to my VM here and uh, see so if it works. So what he's running is through the command line um, of the interface. and. This command line is going to, you see it takes in, this is just a standard one, it takes in that we're going to run the generator. Uh, Matt, I think you're actually running Franconian notch oh. instead of preamble. Thank you very much. Um, Wrong test. And then we're going to use the received frame harness. We're going to use uh, the transmit interface of that GNU radio 802.15.4 that uh, Matt was just mentioning. We're going to be doing this on channel 11 for anyone who wants to jam us. Um, and we're going to be running five iterations because we don't want you to get bored. Um, so what you see now is we're running through the test cases um, each time through, and it'll go through each test case. I think there's 10 test cases in this one, um, five, uh, five iterations of each. So we're going to run through 50 packets. We're going to make sure for each one we get a control case. We have a stable state beforehand. And then we're going to go ahead and run the test case uh, and see if we receive it, right? to see if that radio state machine is able to pick up that modified length. So. Just twiddle your thumbs for a moment here. Yeah. Ryan, tell us a joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's number wank. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who needs random for any of the tests, you could use uh, a new framework that will soon be up at uh, random.online, R-A-N-D-M.online. It's random available via a RESTful interface. Uh, and uh, our lead developers are in the front row. <laughs> I think our marketing team is somewhere here, hopefully. So, it'll be up in no time. Okay. So, um, so when it runs this test, it's gonna, the, when it runs through these test cases, it's going to log the results out to, uh, to a, a, a J JSON file. We have a little script here to, to visualize them. So, uh, okay. So, what we're looking at here um, are the, the ten different test cases that were that were presented by the generator. Remember, we did five, um, uh, only five iterations of this, so um, the sample size isn't huge. But even even with that small sample size, we can begin to see a trend. So uh, if you look down at cases seven and nine, uh, we can see that those were really the only, or, or excuse me, six and eight. Those were the only two cases that, that passed here. Um, so basically, what that means is that this chipset implements a, if, or takes a very, a fairly strict uh, look at the preamble. Um, so by uh, by uh, generating a short preamble, um, uh, by generating a short preamble, we're able to um, basically send frames that this this radio is not able to see. 
Now, let's look at uh, some other radios that we've, we've run this test on. Um, so this is data that we computed earlier today, um, uh, 50 iterations each. Uh, so we did this in advance so that you guys wouldn't have to you know, sit here for 20 minutes per radio while we, while we did this. But here are the results. So we looked at, uh, at three different chipsets. Um, we looked at the CC2420, um, which is a TI radio that is, uh, that is um, on the, the appy mode. Um, we looked at the CC2531, which is another TI radio that's on a more, more modern, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more modern variant of, uh, of that radio made by TI, but we just had that on a little USB dongle. And then also we looked at this Atmel, Atmel chipset as well. And uh, you know, just by looking at the data, we can see that there are some pretty different characteristics among them all. So the two TI radios were able to accept, um, they were able to accept and receive frames that only had one octet of preamble. Whereas the RZ USB stick, um, you know, as we mentioned, expected there to be there to be at least three octets of preamble in order for that to for those messages to be received. So the implications of this are, are pretty interesting. Uh, just with this knowledge, um, if we knew that we wanted to attack a device that was based on um, that was based on a, a TI radio, uh, we would be able to craft short frames that only that target would be able to see, but that other devices implementing other chipsets would be blind to. So. You know, with this knowledge of how the physical, physical layer state machine works, we can begin to uh, fingerprint and, and apply these fingerprints to different attacks uh, that we may want to pursue. Here's our, uh, our back, backup slide in case that didn't work. <laughs> so um, yeah, just, just to recap, um, with knowledge of, uh, of, of how these state machines work and the ability to conduct this sort of fingerprinting, we can do things like evade um, wireless intrusion detection systems. We can evade uh, you know, uh, any sort of uh, you know, tested detection apparatus. And then we can do um, selective targeting of different chipsets. So as we said, we're going to put this up on GitHub. It'll be at riverloopsec slash tumblerf. Uh, and I will push it the repos there so you know you got the right place. I'll push it right after the talk. Um, we would love that the point of this and why we spent so much time developing it to make it something that is extensible is because we want contributions, not just from Mark, but from the rest of you as well. So you do not need to have a radio interface to contribute, right? You could add a new interface you have for your favorite radio, but you could also um, add a harness to check the state of a target. Um, you could add a generator to just brainstorm a new concept that you want to see how it comes out. And we will do our best to run those for you if you, if you don't have the radio gear to set up. Um, and uh, we ask that, you know, also, there's a few things in the code. You'll see some to-dos. If you want to help me out, I'd appreciate it. Um, on that, uh, so some of the dynamic plug-in loading is pretty flexible, but it can be improved. So we want to give a big thank you to Troopers and the ERNOW crew, um, everyone who helps make this, this conference possible. I, I say it. With true sincerity, and I think Matt does as well, this is one of our favorite conferences in the world. Um, and also to the people who let us not work for a week or a few weeks <laughs> and, on paying things and instead get to, to program this. So. Hey, I only have myself to thank for that. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Made the right call. Uh, so those are my thank yous. Matt thanks himself. And uh, <laughs> we appreciate him taking time off to, to write this presentation. It was a little drastic, but it's all good. So uh, yeah, we're happy to take your questions. Questions front row. Yeah. <laughs> lots of que lots of questions from the front row. Just keep the mic. Excellent. Yeah, we'll we'll just pass it back and forward. Uh, you don't have places to be, do you? The sound technician can shut it off up there. Um, I I actually have a question about case eight here. Okay. Like, isn't case eight a valid packet? Yes. Uh, no, case nine is a valid packet. Um, case. No, case eight yeah, is a case eight is the valid packet. Uh, packet. Yeah. So, yeah. so on all three sets of results, you had like invalid reception on yes. case eight, which is valid packet, right? Mm -hmm. So, is that one of the reasons you have to run it multiple times? Like, what there you're seeing like false negatives? Yeah, we're right. probably getting just a frame loss or a corruption or something on it. So okay. RF being a lossy interface means that that there's going to be contention and collision, especially on a protocol like 15.4 that lives in what's called an ISM band. It's the same, bi same band that, um, that Wi-Fi uses so there's, and Bluetooth. So there's lots of other stuff that can uh, interfere with your signals and, and cause, your, cause you to have a bad day. So uh, typically in applications, you have things like um, you know, checksums and acknowledgments and, and you know, automatic retries, things like that built in to, uh, to get around that. So it's all, it's, it's all invisible. 
but, uh, but here we want to build up a large enough sample, sample size that we can, you know, A, get around missed frames like that, and B, also determine if there's any sort of, um, you know, selectivity or sensitivity to any of these cases. I think there's one we can talk about here. Yeah, actually, so if you look at the CC um, uh, 2531 results there, you'll see case two, 13 were valid and 37 were invalid. So that's a case that, that you know, we can, we can you know, posit is right on the margin of what that radio is willing to tolerate. So, you know, if it happened to, you know, be in a state or maybe a couple, you know, symbols just happened to be in, the, be in that, that shift register before we sent that short, short preamble that got it, got it to trigger, um, by increasing our, our, you know, sample size and doing lots of iterations, we can begin to uh, um, just get generally better results and, and more insight into, into how sensitive these, ca these cases are. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. And, uh, and while we take your questions, I'm just gonna, gonna run more results. Uh, so I, I'm just curious if there's a, like a general abstraction for speaking to an SDR or if um, that needs to be implemented per protocol or how that works. Yeah, so it's, it's not too generic, but it is built within the, um, that interface framework. Um, so what I've done is I, I mentioned I modified that, that IEEE 21254 um, flow graph. Um, I bypassed that and then auto-generated the GNU Radio Python. And then once you have that, that's super easy to, to hook into. Um, just make a socket and, and write to it to, to drive it that way. Um, so we don't have like a generic, like there's no like GNU Radio, um, you know, module or GNU Radio, you know, block for, for doing something like that, like this, but it should be pretty easy to script up. Yeah, because I was thinking for file layer stuff, being able to say, I want to use this modulation and then input uh, this bit stream into it um, would be pretty useful. Sounds like a great pull request, Mark. <laughs> Look forward to your contribution. Adam, I'll get right on that. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? I mean, this can keep going for a while, so I'd at least suggest you <laughs> ask questions, because we're just going to wait till time runs out showing you packets. There we go. Oh, Somebody decided shit. it was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe after these run, we can switch to one of the other cases. Yeah, sure. Actually, why don't I do that now? I mean, this, this, is, this, is, boring. Oh. this is boring. <coughs> yeah. So uh, before, you, before you ask your question, well, um, uh, while we answer it, I'm, I'm going to start up the, the uh, Franconian notch generator. What that's going to do is that's going to um, insert uh, uh, non-zero valued symbols into the preamble. So. Um, in this case, it's going to, going to add in just a bunch of Fs. Um, the important thing is that they're, they're, it's not the pattern that the shift register is looking for. So um, it's going to generate a whole bunch of, whole bunch of preambles with that um, th that are not compliant, and we'll see if uh, the radio is able to compensate. Oh, now it's my turn. <laughs> OK, um, I have a question uh, regarding this, um, uh, the bit error rate during the preamble phase. And some chipsets. Um, it is allowed to have that as a parameter. So wouldn't that render your measurements uh, a bit useless if you can change that on the firmware side? There are some chipsets, uh, specifically the CC CC2420, the first one here, that allows you to change um, the required length of the preamble. Are there ones that allow you to change the, the code word mapping? Yeah, so the CC2420, you can change the sync word. OK, um, uh, the sync word, but yeah. yeah. Oh, and like the, the preamble. I don't uh, check back in check back in a few weeks. Um, but the uh, the um, you know you're absolutely right that there are definitely parameters and knobs that radios can you know developers can can turn to to change the way that the radio state machine works. But the um, I think the the answer to that is that um, those are all things that can be fingerprinted. So um, you know you can make some uh, inferences about the chipset, but then say if you have a device that you're going after, you can fingerprint uh, you can fingerprint its particular configuration of the physical layer. So you might say that like, well, you know, a, a traffic light controller, you know, uses the radio, you know, uh, tuned this way really strictly, but maybe my water meter is really lax. So, um, so you can start to characterize um, things on the device level as well. Yeah, for these tests, we left all of the radios, the receive radios in their standard configuration. Um, so we're just like, what would, what would off the shelf look like? And I, we've seen those registers being removed on some of the newer radios. So like the 2531 does not have documented uh, registers, registers to allow you to make those changes. Uh, same with the Atmel chip. Um, and we have not found the undocumented ones yet. So 
we're not sure if they're there and we haven't found them or if they're not there. All right, so we have some results from the Frank Franconian notch case that we can talk about briefly. So if you look at case zero here, um, this is the, the compliant 15-4 um, preamble. You see we have, we have the four octets of, uh, of zeros followed by the, the, the traditional co-word. Then for, uh, for subsequent iterations, what we're doing is we're inserting uh, a non-standard um, preamble symbol um, as we go. So um, down at the, the bottom, case eight, um, there, are, there are no zeros in the preamble. It's all just, just some other symbol. So uh, if we look at the results here, we see that this radio is actually able to do pretty well with this. So the um, Atmel radio is able to detect uh, the case where um, there are only two zero-valued symbols in there um, to give it um, A, you know, awareness that, the, that there's a packet about to be received and B, the clock recovery information. So um, that, that's another case where if you had a device that, um, that was on an Atmel radio versus a TI radio, you could implement, a, um, you could implement this type of, uh, of state machine to you know, do even more precise selective targeting. Anything you want to add to that? No, um, I guess you could be really risky and try to run it on the other box to show them the other radio trip live. Which one? The, the CT2531. Uh, uh, probably not worth doing live. We, we can, not we worth doing live. We but you know it. what? I mean, we'll take questions while we watch Matt crash the system. It's really, it's really finicky. I actually have two questions for you. How descriptive is your Python or DSL language in Python to describe different state machines? And the other one is, did you ever try like doing a learning mode or something similar that you listen to over there and then you logically try to flip it? Yeah, basically using, do. Using either using like generations or mutations or something similar. Yeah, um, so for this, I'll answer the, the second one first. Um, we have the generators stubbed out expecting to need to do that, um, to do the, the mutation-based fuzzing. So there's places where it can listen on a radio and feed in a sample set, and then the generator can use that to permute over. Um, none of the tests we have in today uh, permute off of live radio traffic. Uh, they're, they're based off of either, we have one more that we haven't shown that's based off of a captured or a, a a base frame and then just randomizes off of there. Um, but definitely something that could be done and something I want to add in um, test cases for. And, and sorry, that. Yeah, so for the state machine, we don't actually try to model the receive radio state machine currently. Um, what we do have in our DSL is inside the generator describing how you want to make those packets. Um, so we are currently using Scappy to do the, uh, you know, to describe the packets. So that gives us very good flexibility. So in the 802.15.4 space, across uh, Zigbee, six low WPAN, and um, 802, raw 802.15.4, and, and should work for. I don't think there's thread implemented on it. What? what um, cell. Uh, we did not put any cell in. Uh, I will defer to Matt if he wants to answer that one. Uh, yeah, that, that'd be pretty interesting. Um, that would be a lot more to, to, to instrument and script up than a um, you know, low complexity commodity radio like this, but. It would be really interesting. Yeah. So my, um, the, other, the other dongle's not cooperating. So. Okay, fair So just, just one live demo today. <laughs> Two. Um, Two. Yeah, Good I question though, yeah. It would be, we wanna add, just, sorry, just to answer that one. We do wanna add on those things on top. So I think one of the next ones we were gonna add was uh, Bluetooth. Probably using uh, Ubertooth. Oh, and um, and RFCAT as well. Yeah, we'll make an RFCAT stuff. Uh, right now, Scappy is just being used to to build up these packets. Uh, actually, right now it's just building the Mac layer of those packets. So then we're just adding on the Phi um, in the current demos. Yeah. Um, but I think the the important thing about the architecture is that the way the generators are abstracted, um, you can use any fuzzer, any, any software fuzzer um, you want, including your own fuzzing logic. So we happen to use Scappy because it has um, you know, pretty good 15.4 support. Um, thanks, Ryan. Um, but if you wanted to say, you know, use Peach or any, of, any, other, you know, genera um, any other fuzzer, you can just you know, implement a generator class that hooks into that, and then, that'll, and then the, the framework will handle the conversion and management of that data into the, the radio domain and back. Yeah, yeah. so for cell, you need to implement a harness as well, right, to, to, cap to capture what's happening, right? So you'd, either, you'd have to say, have some feedback mechanism, whether it's an acknowledgment frame that you're listening for, 
or something on a base station, right? If you have a base station you can test with, then you'd, you'd implement the harness on there. Yeah, you need both sides. Is that like pluggable or doable? Yeah, the harness is also pluggable. So right now we have the, the serial, the SSH, and then the listening for frames. Um, so I think it would be a question of if you want to, uh, of how you want to measure success. If you'd use one of those, you may be able to use the SSH one on like an open BTS system um, to, to watch for things coming through on its side. Um, but yeah, that's also a pluggable class. Yeah. So the, the SSH harness, just for a little more context, like you'd be able to have the harness log into a system, like tail a log or listen on some interface and compare it against some regex, right? And then you can make a comparison over, you know, whether it functioned properly or not based on that. Um, that's all scripted and that's the sort of thing that you could you could take and very easily move into a system like that. You just have to define what the, you basically just have to inherit that and then define what merits success and failure and then point it at your system. Um, did you ever consider fussing the analog part? So to, to explain what I'm after, so I'm, I was designing for maybe two years a decoder for a pretty simple protocol and uh, what I learned is that there are two kinds of issues that you encounter. One is, of course, on, I would say, the data or the digital layer, where you have ones where you would expect zeros or the other way around. And the other thing is, on, on the analog side, you can have things like um, jitter frequency uh, variations, so instability in the frequency. And instability in the frequency gives very interesting effects in your in the interface to your state machine, to put it that way. So I would assume that if you start to vary the carrier frequency or other stuff on the analog side that should in theory not have any impact on the digital side, that you would get completely different results out of almost everything. Um, but at this point, well, I did not look into fussing, so I'm not aware of any hardware that uh, would provide as instrumentation for that. But did you ever think about this or anybody else? Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting question. And, and you're right in the sense that, uh, you know, instability and things like that can produce drastically different results in different radios. Um, if you were to want to implement something like that within this framework, that's the sort of thing that you could do within an interface. You would inherit the interface and um, you would have to, you know, basically bring your own radio that provided that sort of exposure. And then you could, you could use the interface function to hook, it, hook into it to change those parameters. And if there are no parameters um, in the default class that, that suit your use case, you can always add the hooks to, to do that more fine-grained control. So could, could that be done with like a software-defined radio? They just wouldn't be able to use the same pipeline. Exactly, yeah. Now. So, so you, could, you could use a software-defined radio to generate um, a waveform that's tweaked in all sorts of arbitrary and you know, finite ways. Um, you have to write the DSP logic yourself, but um, you wouldn't be tied to you know, performing functions that, that a commodity chipset would restrict you to. Yeah, so, so yes, maybe. So probably what, what I would consider was um, not actually manipulating the waveform of the DSP side, but actually manipulating uh, the frequency source of the, of the whole thingy, because this would introduce um, effects that are, well, beyond what I could easily do on the digital side. So I, maybe we discuss this later. Yeah, sure. Be happy to chat. Um, I think, you know, based on what you're saying, I, I think that it would be possible to, to instrument that. It's just the generation of the waveform would be left up to uh, a radio that would be, you know, hooked up to through an interface, but not, you know, you know, th this the framework doesn't provide the radio. It just provides the control. So if you could provide the radio, then you could hook it up to this. Yeah, and we could take in those parameters. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk more after. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, just one suggestion for that, uh, you could use uh, random.online to generate your uh, randomness for frequency variation and the generated signal. You are correct. You are correct. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Any it more questions? It is good random. It is very good random. The best. the best random, one might say. <laughs> All right. If there are no more questions, then thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.